Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Talking Cardboard. As always, my name is Corey, and uh, as always, if you enjoy the content you see here on the channel, please consider subscribing. We really do appreciate it. Uh, but with that being said, this is Talking Cardboard's very first board game deathmatch. <laughs> Let's get started. That's right, this is our very first episode of Board Game Deathmatch, just putting two games against each other to see which one wins. If these two were to get down in the ring and fight each other to the death, which one would be the surviving game? So let's talk about our very first matchup. It's Merv versus Whistle Mountain. Two very extremely popular hot Euro games that came out within the last year. Two that are, you know, pretty much completely different, but uh, but have some, you know, similarities in kind of the dryness and and kind of uh, I want to say lack of theme. Even though Whistle Mountain will definitely win in the theme category, but uh, you know, they're just they're both Euro strategy games that I wanted to compare with one another, and uh, well, not not compare, but just fight against each other to see which one will win. I'm starting with Merv here. Merv, I would say, is the drier out of the two. Definitely does not have as much theme going on as Whistle Mountain. In Merv, uh, the heart of the Silk Road, you are basically sending a worker around a static square board. Each side of the board, there's four different sides, uh, hence the square board. Um, each side, you have to stop your worker on before continuing on to the next round, where you can put them onto the next side of the square, and you basically go around. It's played over three years, or three cycles, and in each cycle, you've got four turns. So you only get 12 turns throughout the whole game. Where you stop along the track really matters in this game. You are basically stopping on a spot in either a column or as you move further around in a row, and you can trigger one of the action squares in that column or row. Uh, a couple different things going on with these actions that I find really cool and really unique in this game is that you are not only deciding where to place your house on which spot to trigger that specific action, but you're also trying to upgrade those spots as you go, because once your house is on there, you are claiming ownership of it, and you get residual benefits throughout the game for that. But you are also gathering resources and triggering this combo chain of resources as you go as well. Each time you send out a worker and trigger, let's say, that column or row, you are triggering all the houses of that same color for resources. So you can really combo the gameplay to try to uh, strategize where your houses are going to be to trigger the exact resources you need. The reason why, I'll get back to the actions later, but the reason why you need the resources is very, very critical. There are these tracks around the board and you're, you're spending resources to go up on these tracks in various ways. There's a track that the higher you go up, you are manipulating end round victory points and a multiplier for those end round victory points. So the higher you go up on that track, you get to multiply those bonus victory points even that much more. There are other places where you're going out on the heart of the Silic Road and you are uh, gathering rare goods and common goods to then later turn into uh, fulfill these contracts. You have other tracks where you are looking to put down these these walls or gates to protect your houses because at the end of the second round and the end of the third round you've got the Mongols that are attacking the city and if you don't have a gate that's protecting your houses they will actually tear down your houses and you have to rebuild them in future rounds so it's kind of cool trying to protect your actions for the long game so that's a really neat aspect as well and there's also another track common theme here there's just so many tracks different track manipulation going on so if you don't like moving up on tracks you're not going to like this game but I I feel like it's kind of like a, a tech tree of sorts where you're trying to uh, hone in on a couple of the tracks and specialize in those to move up as far as you can um, to get the better multipliers and that sort of thing. But one of the other places you're going to, you're collecting these scrolls that you can then turn in at the university to get a special ability that is unique to you and nobody else for the rest of the game. And if you're the first one there, you get the first option at it. So you will, you will be the only one the rest of the game with that special ability if you can beat people to it by gathering scrolls. So you're gathering resources and scrolls and moving up on these different tracks and trying to specialize and getting more bonus multipliers for victory points. 
All in the while, you're trying to block your opponent from certain columns or rows so they can't place a house in that column or row during that turn, and maybe you can. And then you can choose to protect your own buildings from the Mongols so they don't burn your buildings down, or for uh, an even bigger bonus, you can actually choose to protect other players' buildings. So that's a cool, neat, strategic option, and there's just there's just a lot going on in this game. But like I said, definitely the drier out of the two games. I'm going to give my final rating of this game at the end of this head-to-head -head combat review. I want to kind of jump over to Whistle Mountain here now, but at the very end, I will give my overall rating for both games and ultimately crown one of these two games the victor. So in Whistle Mountain, like I said, it's got a little bit more theme going on than Merv. They're both somewhat dry games, and they both have some worker placement style actions to them, but I would say Whistle Mountain is a little bit heavier on the theme, which is nice. It's it's a little bit lighter of a game overall versus Merv, but it's got a little bit more theme, which I enjoy. This is more on the light to middleweight style Euro game, and this is, uh, this is I would say, a solid middleweight Euro, if not inching a little bit above the middleweight category. Whistle Mountain, like I said, with the theme going on here, it's, uh, you know, it's got a little bit of theme. I would say it's a little bit of a stretch still, but you've got this dam that's holding back water that's protecting your scaffolding on the other side from getting flooded. Uh, like I said in Merv, you're you're basically using that one worker and placing it on to trigger columns or rows, and you're using that only that one worker the whole entire game. In Whistle Mountain, it's got actually some more worker placement going on, where you have three different airships, a small, medium, and large size airship that you're sending around the board and placing on the board to do various actions. You've got these little inlet zones around the board that are called the docks in Whistle Mountain that if you send your airship there, you can just take that worker placement action by spending an amount of resources equal to the cost associated with that action. It's anywhere from getting cards to your hand that are one-time free actions that you can use on your turn to getting more resources to spend on things. There's a spot that'll get you machines to build out on top of the scaffolding. And there's another few places that you can actually collect scaffolding, uh, spend, spend resources to get it and place it in front of you. And then on a later turn, you can do an action that'll allow you to place that scaffolding out onto the board. As you're placing the scaffolding, it's kind of like Tetris-like pieces that you're trying to fit in uh, different orientations on the board and fit in just how you want it. What's really neat about the way those pieces are oriented on the board is that depending on where you place them, it'll open up adjacency bonuses based on where you or your opponents place their airships on the sides of them in the future. You can fly your airship up to the side of scaffolding and whatever part of your airship is touching the scaffolding adjacently and orthogonally to those bonuses gather you different resources. So that is one of the main ways you gather resources in this game. And another thing you can do with those machines I was talking about is you can spend the amount of resources required to purchase them and put them in front of you. But on a later turn, you can use an action that you can place a machine on top of the scaffolding wherever you choose. The machines aren't allowed to hang off the scaffolding in any way. They have to be completely solid on top of all scaffolding pieces. And, uh, and you know, that's, that's kind of a fun, the fun part of the puzzle as well in this game. But once the machine is placed, you immediately get victory points for placing out that piece of machinery, but then that becomes a worker placement spot for you and your opponents for the rest of the game. So usually you're docking your airships around the board or placing them orthogonally adjacent to scaffolding to collect resources, but what machines allow you to do is place your airship on top of the machine wherever it was built to use a special ability action. And all the machines are completely different from one another. All the scaffolding pieces are completely different. So each game is, is variable and uh, will play out differently every time depending on what pieces come uh, come forth onto the board and, and that sort of thing. So the variability is real nice in this game. I would say the variability is probably a little bit better than Merv as well. Um, but you know, spoilers, I, I love both games. So like I said, we'll get to that later. But also in Whistle Mountain, one other thing I wanted to touch on before kind of wrapping up this, uh, this deathmatch fight is that the machines do one more thing for you. And it's, it's kind of a two-part answer here. So one thing I haven't talked about yet in Whistle Mountain is you've got uh, workers that are on the side of the mountain that are kind of hanging out and, and working on the mountain. As the water rises above and, and over the dam and starts flooding the region, 
If your workers get flooded out of the mountain, they get sucked down into a whirlpool zone that you then have to save them from drowning. So one of the actions you can take in this game is actually either moving your workers around on the scaffolding or you can pay extra to rescue them from the whirlpool and place them up on one of the scaffolding pieces of your choosing. The reason why I said it's a two-part answer is you're not only rescuing them from either the, mount, the side of the mountain before the water hits them or the whirlpool from drowning, but you're also trying to place them in a strategic place to where you can build a machine on top of them. Because if you can strategically place a machine on top of where one of your workers is, they get promoted and they get sent to work on that machine um, with, a, with a higher title. With a, you know, they get promoted and sent off to the side of the board and for the rest of the game, they are said to be working that machine um, after their new promotion. The reason why that is really good is the higher you can promote one of your workers on the mountain, the more end game victory points you get. The higher up the mountain, the more points you get. Also, in each zone of the mountain, depending on where they get promoted, because they get sent uh, straight to the side of the mountain, however high up they got promoted on the scaffolding, um, you get a one-time use tile that you get if you're the first player to go there as well. So you get a one-time bonus that you can use, so you're trying to race to these different sections of the mountain to get those one-time bonus tiles. And then also the higher up you go, the more endgame scoring you get. So there's a lot of little things going on. For how light this game is, it, it sounds a lot heavier than, than what I'm making it sound like. Uh, for how light it is, it does have a lot of fun strategic options, and it's just a, a fun game all around. I, I highly, highly recommend it. Merv being a little bit on the drier side. You've got to really come into Merv being a, a more hardcore Euro gamer who's looking for something a little bit lighter than a heavy game. This is more of a medium weight strategy Euro game that's got, it's real, real dry, but if you know people who like the idea of trying to get to different spots first to trigger, uh, you know, different chain reactions to get bonuses that way and also move, move up and manipulate these tracks in almost like different tech tree type options, then Merv is more for you. I don't want to... I don't really want to say tech tree, that's kind of the only way I can really describe it, but you are almost moving up these, these different tracks in that manner to uh, trigger different actions and different bonus points in different ways. So having said that, let's get into my final ratings. Okay, and like I said, the final ratings for these games are going to be very difficult for me because I really do love both these games. So much so that I'm going to give them both the same score. They're both an 8.5 out of 10 for me. Uh, this might differ as I get more plays uh, to the table with the Talking Cardboard crew, and I'd love to hear their opinions on it, but truth be told, none of them have played either one of these games yet. It's only been me, and I've been playing them a lot with my wife, so a lot of two-player. Uh, they might play differently at three, four players, but uh, so far I've been loving them both at two-player. So the eight and a half out of 10, these games are just rock solid, excellent games for me. I would recommend them both, but for different reasons, like I stated earlier. So they, um, they're definitely different enough. They've both been getting a lot of hype and a lot of buzz over the last year and are both kind of brand new hits that I've been hearing talked about a lot, but um, they're both completely different and will appeal to different types of gamers, but also to a gamer like me that'll enjoy them both for their differences. And that brings us to the moment you've all been waiting for, the final deathmatch fight to the death, which game is going to win out in the end? And, oh, it's just such a tough decision. But the way I came to the conclusion on who is going to win this fight is just basically the game I think that's going to appeal to more people. The game that's going to be maybe a little bit easier to teach, a little bit easier to get to the table, a little bit more, um, you know, just overall appeal to more gamers. Like I said, I, I love them both. I gave them both the same rating. They're both staying in my collection for a long, long time, and I like them for different reasons. One's a little bit lighter, one's a little bit heavier, one's a little bit more dry, one's a little bit more themey. But having said that, if I had to choose one winner, I'm going to choose Whistle Mountain. Congratulations, Whistle Mountain. You are the winner of today's death match. Unfortunately, Merv falls down. For me, both games staying in my collection for a long, long time, but Whistle Mountain, it just had to win out because it, it does, I think it will, and it does appeal to more people and uh, 
you know, as the sales go on, I don't know which one will sell more. As, uh, as the hype kind of runs out, I don't know which game will be talked about more for an extended period of time. Only time will tell. But for now, I really think Whistle Mountain deserves the crown in today's deathmatch. So, until next time, you all have a great day. Enjoy gaming. Leave comments below. I love to hear from you. And you all have a great day.